Hi guys, Erin here. In this video, you'll learn about different methods of selecting participants to obtain a more or less representative sample. We'll talk about two main categories of sampling, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling is when the exact size of the population is known. It's possible to list all of the people that are in that population. And so as a result, we know the probability that we'll select a particular person. An example of this might be if we're interested in a question that pertains just to our class, we could list all of the students in our class and we know that each student has a one in 200 chance of being selected. Or maybe we might be interested in people in Niagara because of census data, we could list all of the people who are in Niagara and we know that the probability of being selected is, you know, one in 450,000 or whatever the population of Niagara is. As a result of these features, the selection process is unbiased. Each individual has an equal chance of being selected. On the other hand, the other category of sampling methods is non-probability sampling. These are the kind of sampling methods that you'll probably read about in papers that you read. It's typically used in psychology and social sciences when the target population that we're interested in is much larger and so it's not possible to list all of the people in that target population. So maybe we're interested, for example, in, in people in general or university students in general. Because we can't list all of the people in those target populations and because we don't know the probability of selecting a particular individual, it's more likely that the sample will be biased. We're going to talk now about different probability sampling and non-probability sampling methods that we can use to ensure a more or less representative sample. So let's start with probability sampling methods. The most basic is simple random sampling. This is when participants are selected from a list containing the total population. So maybe, for example, students are randomly selected from our class list. There's two features that, that is good about this method. Um, each individual has an equal chance of being selected. This is equality. And independence is the other great feature. The choice of one individual doesn't influence or bias the probability of selecting another individual. So let's give an example. Let's say we're interested in how much sleep uh, students in this year's 2P52 class get in an average night. Well, we may have our list of students and I might send an email out to the first 30 students and ask you um, how much sleep you got in the last few nights. So with this method, it's up to chance to determine who is going to participate in our study, who will be selected. With larger sample size, this usually gives an, a balanced, fairly representative sample of our target population. But with small sample sizes, it's possible to get a very distorted sample that's not representative of our target population. So if we go back to our example of sleep in our 2P52 class, it might be just by chance that the first 30 students in the class list are all girls who live at home this year. And as a result, the amount of sleep that those people get might not be representative of other people maybe who are male or who are maybe living with roommates. If it may just be by chance that a sample of our population is not representative. So what can we do um, to target our sampling to ensure that it's more representative? Well, there's two main ways that we can do this. Stratified random sampling and proportionate strat stratified sampling. Let's talk about each of these now. So in stratified random, we divide the population into layers, different groups, and then we randomly select equal numbers from each group. So we may sample, for example, an equal number of males and females, or we may sample an equal number of people who live at home with their family this year versus people who live with their roommates. This method has its pros and cons. The benefit is now both groups are equally represented, represented in our sample. The downside is that this might not actually be representative of our target population if those subgroups aren't equally represented in the target population. So in our class, for example, we tend to have more girls than guys. If we selected an equal number of girls and guys to make up our sample, their sample is no longer gonna be representative of our target class. Instead, proportion stratified would say, okay, if there's 70% girls in the target population, we want to ensure that our sample also has 70% girls. So in this method, we divide the population into layers, into groups, and then we randomly select so that the proportion in our sample is representative of the proportion of those subgroups in the target population. Let's give it another example so this is all clear. 
Imagine we are interested in the fine motor skills of kindergarten students in the District of School Board of Niagara. We want to know how well they're learning to cut with scissors, for example. We know that in general, 10% of kids are left-handed, let's say, and we want to ensure a representative sample of participants. We plan to recruit a sample of 30 students. So using a stratified random sample, how many of our 30 participants would be left-handed versus right-handed? Well, equal numbers are represented in each group. That would mean that we'd have 15 right-handed kids and 15 left-handed kids who would be recruited as our participants for our study. Each group is representative, represented, but the downside is that the overall sample doesn't reflect the composition of the target population in which um, only 10% of kids are actually left-handed. Using a proportion stratified sample, um, how many of our 30 participants would be left-handed versus right-handed? Well, if 10% of the target population is left-handed, then we would want 10% of our sample to also be left-handed. In this case, we'd have three left-handed kids and 27 right-handed kids in our sample. So the great thing about this is that the proportion in our sample accurately represent the composition of our target population. But the downside is here we only have three left-handed kids. And so we can ensure that our, an accurate representation of this segment of the population is gonna occur from those th only three participants. So with proportion stratified sample, we need to have a larger sample size to make sure that all of those individual subgroups are equally rep are represented um, well. So your textbook um, lists all of the different methods of probability and non-probability sampling. I encourage you to read this, make sure you know the pros and cons of each sampling technique and can think in your head of an example of each of them. They differ in the extent to which the uh, sampling process is more random, relies more on chance, versus effort has been taken to ensure a more representative sample. So we talked about the different methods of stratified sampling to show that. Um, more representative sample methods of obtaining a more representative sample. In the middle are two other methods. Systematic sampling is very similar to simple random sampling. We've got our list of all of our people. Um, but in this case, rather than just taking, you know, the top 20, we would start randomly in the list and then choose every 10th participant, 10th person, for example, to be a participant in our study. Cluster sampling um, is also somewhere there in the middle, where rather than selecting individuals, our sample is obtained by randomly selecting pre-existing groups that exist within our target population and then asking them to be our participants. So maybe we would go to certain classes in Niagara and just test those children that are in that class and, and hope that that class will give us then a representative sample of all of the kids in Niagara. If we go back to the example of our 2P52 class, maybe rather than selecting from a list of all students, we'd say, okay, all of the students in seminar three, for example, how much sleep did you have? So again, like I said, read up about them, make sure you understand the pros and cons and can give an example. So we talked about probability sampling. Let's talk now about non-probability sampling. Because like I said earlier, it's probably the um, kind of sampling method that you're gonna read about in studies that, that you encounter. Because with non-probability sampling, we're interested in a target population that's so big and so general that we can't list everybody in that target population. So this might be we're interested in university students or, or people in general. There's two methods um, of non-probability sampling that differ again in how representative the sample will end up achieving. In convenience sampling, we it's really just the easiest way of sampling participants. We just ask who wants to be a participant and we select those that are available and willing to participate in our study. Most research, as we know, is typically done in universities. So this means that most research you're gonna read involves university students as participants who are getting maybe, you know, course credit for participating. This is probably the most commonly used method of sampling that you'll encounter. It's easy, it's fast, it's cheap to recruit people, but it's probably biased and it's probably not representative of that target population of people in general that the researchers were interested in. In what ways can convenience sampling be biased or unrepresentative? Well, in what ways do you think university students are different from the general population? 
why don't you think about that for a second? How are you different than the average person in Ontario? Well, when I asked that question to students in 2P52 last year, they gave all kinds of great differences. For example, you might be younger than the average person in Ontario. You may be more educated. You may be more intelligent. Somebody also suggested that you may be struggling with finances more than the average person. So all of these factors may be characteristics of the sample that if we only select university students that don't actually reflect characteristics of the larger target population. So in what ways can we minimize problems with convenience sampling? Well, we can do quota sampling. So quota sampling is a type of convenient sampling that first involves identifying subgroups that we want to include in our study and then establishing quotas of how many individuals for each group we want to recruit. It's kind of like the process of stratified random sampling in that we are trying to make sure that different subgroups of people are represented in our sample. So maybe we want to ensure that we are testing males and females. Maybe we want to ensure that we're testing not only university students, but also people, you know, that we recruit from downtown St. Catharines, let's say. Um, this is probably the method that you'll read in a lot of studies that you're exposed to, at least the higher quality papers that are trying to at least ensure that their sample is a little bit more representative of the target population. How is this different than stratified random or proportion stratified? Well, the main difference is because our target population is much larger and we can't list everybody that's in our target population, we're not randomly selecting people. Um, and so there's more opportunity for biases to come in. So to summarize this video, again, what we've talked about this week, the goal of research is to measure a sample and to use the results from that sample to generalize about how a particular variable exists in the general population. We need to be careful that our sample is representative of that general population. In this video, you learned about two methods, general categories of sampling. In probability sampling, we know the odds of selecting a particular individual, and you learned about five types that differ in how much effort is taken to ensure that sample is representative. In non-probability sampling, we don't know the odds of selecting a particular individual. Um, and so for biases to come in and you learned about two types of sampling that differ in how representative the sample might be. The goal of this is for you to be aware of these different sampling techniques, to think about their pros and cons, to think about um, what is the best method to ensure that your sample is representative of the target population and not biased. And you want to think about this um, when you read papers so that you can um, be, you know, critical of the conclusions that they come up with. And you also want to think about this when it comes to doing your own research for your own research proposal. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.